Thank you very much for coming, uh, all of you. I know it's, it's the last talk. I, actually, it's the first talk after the lunch on the last day. So I'm pretty surprised that there's still people going to uh, talk. So thank you very much for being here today. Uh, it's really, really an amazing opportunity for me to be here because, uh, because it's RiceConf and because I work for a company that somehow was born uh, at one of the RISE conferences. So it's really, really super exciting for me to be here. Today I'm going to talk about developing and maintaining a platform with RISE and uh, Hanami. As you can see, the title is slightly different than the, uh, what you have published on the, on the program because by the time I proposed the talk and the talk was accepted, the framework changed the name. Uh, so that's why you can see like uh, RISE and Hanami today. So, uh, sometimes I will mention Lotus, but actually Lotus is an army today. So uh, keep in mind that's the new, the new name. Now, yesterday I was struggling. I was trying to find a way to break the ice because normally I'm really, really uh, super nervous when I am on stage. And uh, so I was talking with my coworkers and I was like, what can I do? And they, they were saying to me, like, we have candies. I was like, yeah, but I cannot throw candies on the stage. And I was like, why not? So I want to start the, the talk. I want to make sure that all of you are you know, focused and getting my attention um, by just playing a new game, which is uh, throw and catch the candies. <laughs> so I will, hopefully, I will not hit anybody. Here we go. You can take some of the candies. Here we go. And we have more candies over there, in the front here, here, and over there. OK. We have more after. Don't worry, don't worry. Just stay focused. That's the goal. You, know, you have to stay focused. You have to catch the candy when I'm throwing that. OK, great. Let's start. So my name is Simone. I work for DN Simple. My nickname is Webpos, pretty much everywhere, GitHub, Twitter. And um, I work for DN Simple, which is a company who provides DN, uh, domain name registration, DNS hosting, and SSL certificates. Uh, now, you might have or not heard about us, but probably you heard about some of our amazing customers. So we provide service to Ruby Gems. So if you installed any of the gems, uh, you use our infrastructure. We provide service for RaceConf and many other services, including uh, Travis CI, for example. Now, I have a, before I start getting into the core of my talk, I have a very important public service announcement. This is not my birthday today. Now, 99% uh, of you won't get this joke, but I know at least two people over there will get that, so you can ask explanation after that. But it was really important for my safety to say that it's not my birthday today. Uh, okay, let's get started. Today, I will stop laughing. So today I want to tell you a story. And uh, this is a story about a feature we have been working on for at least a couple of years at uh, DN Simple. So what I want to do today is that I want to share the decision that we made during the development of this feature. And I want to share with you some of the behind of the scenes that um, facilitated the adoption of the decisions that we made. Now, the, the story is about a new component of our system, which is the new version of the API, API version 2. Now, it's not going to be another talk about building the API with Race or any other framework. So if you came here with uh, the idea of not hearing about building API, that's the right talk. But of course, I had to spoke about some experience, and our experience would be close enough to the idea of uh, the API. Now, we have been providing API in DN Simple since the very beginning, since 2010. That's a really core component of our, our service. And our customers use our API for a variety of reasons. For example, registering domains, or provisioning new DNS records, for example, through Chef, or purchasing SSL certificates. Now, the way people interacted with our infrastructure back in 2013 and 2014 was I'd say a traditional way. So we have the DN Simple application and we have like a normal standard set of traditional API. But we wanted to do something different. We wanted to um, extend, to provide, to shift the focus from like this standard set of API towards an idea of a platform, a toolkit for building things around DN Simple. 
And so in 2016, actually in 2014, we started re-engineering our API. And uh, so as of today, we still have the standard set of you know, API and uh, application, but we also started offering uh, OAuth, we started offering web books and uh, official uh, clients in different languages. Now, the interesting part is that besides the clients that are the official clients that are now developing in different languages, um, in addition to Ruby, pretty much the rest of the things you can see here are designed and built with Ruby, okay? So now that I shared a little bit more about the background, uh, what I wanna show you today is essentially uh, three different messages. The first one I wanna share to, with you today, uh, the D and simple approach with Rails. Uh, I wanna present you the Anami framework, which is the framework that we used in order to build this part of, this new part of the, of the and simple. And uh, I wanna show you how you can use Anami or any other framework to interact with Rails. This is actually possible. So let's get started with the first part of the presentation, the DN simple approach to race. Now, our approach is a little bit different than the traditional race way, I'd say. And the reason is because we have uh, a pretty large application, and um, so it's not really uncommon as soon as your application start growing beyond you know, the standard race blog application to face huge need of um, having a lot of uh, different needs within the same application, like talking with external services and so on. So uh, if your application starts growing, you will likely hit the same kind of troubles that we did. And so one of the key principles for us was to be able to, co to write code that we can maintain, okay? We have been in business for six years and we hope we'll be in business for even more years. So the idea is that we need to have code that can be maintained uh, for a long time. So you cannot really change, you cannot really have full control of your code unless you uh, write your own code, right? I still remember the days when the transition between Rails 2 and Rails 3 uh, make a difference between the way that JSON was serialized. So before we had like the root, uh, the model that was the root of the JSON and then suddenly from Rails 2 to Rails 3, everything changed. But you cannot really go back and change uh, like in one month, the API that all your customers have been using, right? So what you wanna do is that you wanna be in control of your code. And for us, race is just another component that we wanna be in control of. So what we do essentially is that every dependency that we use in DN simple is wrapped behind a custom API. Uh, so this is a very super simple example here. Uh, in some part of our code, we need to deal with phone validation. So we use a library, which is called Phony, that performs like validation and normalization of phone numbers. And uh, rather than going and calling Phony directly, what we did is that we wrap the Phony library behind some custom code. This is a DN simple phone module. Now, the very interesting thing about that is that at some point, this is the final code that you see, at some point, we had to introduce some whitelisted numbers. And the reason is because uh, Phony was not catching some like particular countries, uh, was not able to understand those country phone number uh, formats. And so what we had to do is that we had to introduce a whitelist. And that was super simple, super easy to be done because we just introduced the whitelist within the module and we didn't have to go and change all the code, um, all the previous code that I was using the library directly. So this is a very super simple example of how you can build um, your, you can improve the maintenance of your code just by writing a little bit of extra code rather than going directly with a gem. Uh, so some of the advantages of this approach is that side features or exten extensions like the whitelist can be introduced without really changing uh, the code base. Incompatibilities can be addressed in a single place. And uh, if you need to replace the underlying library, you can do that in a single place rather than going and changing all the single uh, metal codes. And another really important component and advantage is that testing doesn't require extensive st stopping. Now, I don't know. Uh, what's your code, but our code is, was using, and still uses a large number of stops. Uh, and this is not really extremely maintainable in the long run. Um, so this approach is much more flexible. And in fact, here's an example of another component we have, another uh, library we have inside our code where we um, can avoid using the stopping. So here we have a resolver, which is one library that deal with uh, our custom uh, DNS record called the alias. 
and that performs the resolution. Uh, we have adapters behind the scenes. We have a null adapter that essentially discards all the requests. We have a test adapter that is what we use in testing, so rather than stabbing, we can flip to this adapter and we can feed the adapter with the response that we expect in the test. And then we have the Go uh, production adapter that will um, rely on our uh, Golang uh, implementation of the alias record. And this is turned on by default in production. And this is an example of how we use that in the test environment. We can simply switch to the test mode and we can feed the adapter with the kind of response that we expect and then we can test that rather than, and we have the full control of our code. We don't need to use mock because we don't need to mock the original libraries. That's a really huge advantage. Uh, of course, another component that we have uh, to deal with that is active record. And in that particular case, we have special guidelines for active record. So here's a few ones. For example, methods defined in active record base, like find, where, uh, and so on, cannot be used outside the model itself. Instead, the models must expose a custom API to perform operation, and we call them the finders. So we have specific objects that are called finders. Callbacks are not allowed anywhere except for data integrity, and the query methods in active record cannot be used outside the models or the finders. So any code outside the model, um, sorry, any code in the application only interact with those finders. And finally, scopes can be invoked directly, but they are used just to compose the queries within the finders. Here's an example of a finder. Um, we have, for example, an implementation, a custom implementation for the find. I don't know how many of you had the problem that the default find version uses the um, out increment key of the database, but sometimes you need a string. You need to search for a string. So you don't really want to override the default find because other libraries or plugin may rely on that specific behavior. So this is an example of a custom finder. And then this is an example of a different finder that uses a variation of an input. For example, we want the TLD to be uh, not case sensitive during the, the query. Another example are default scopes. Um, another example are default orders. You don't really want to set default orders in the model because other, in other places you will have to uh, de-override the defaults. And then another example here is when you, you want to have queries that instead of returning active record relations, returns, for example, an array of elements. Now, all those kind of methods, and then we have the last one, which is uh, a specific implementation of the not found where we raise a custom message rather than the default one in active record because the default one in active record uh, includes information about the query. So for example, the where parameters. Uh, now all this code allows us to um, be independent from the underlying implementation of active record and improves our, our maintenance. Of course, these guidelines are the result of years of experiments and discussions. They are not written in stone and they keep changing and evolving during the, in, uh, within the team based on the experience we have. And that's why I also want to take a few seconds to say thank you to all the team members of the Simple for contributing to these guidelines and for contributing to the quality of the, of the project. Uh, oh, wow, we have another candy time, so more candy here. I was not expecting that. Ah, over there. Here we go. Candy here, there, candies. And who was missing candy? Oh, yeah. Here we go. Actually, instead of presenting, I could go and play baseball. OK, awesome. Let's move on. Next step is what I call the MVC Plus. Uh, it's essentially a different approach that we have in the Simple to structure our application. Uh, traditionally, if we don't consider the view part, traditionally your application have two layers, you know, the model and the controller. But in the Simple, we essentially have four layers, right? So we have um, the controllers, we have the models, and in the middle we have commands and services. I'm gonna explain a little bit what uh, what are the, the needs for these uh, extra layers. Now, this is the request, okay? The user is performing an HTTP request, and the request can either be an API request or uh, a normal request to a browser, right? So the request is sent to the controller. The, the controller handles the request, and it can be a race controller or it can't. I mean, we don't really have to, uh, but let's pretend it is for now. Now, the controller handles the incoming request, 
uh, incoming request, validates the input, parses the output, uh, parses the parameter, uh, stops malform request, um, authenticate the request. Uh, but what's important is that the controller has no business logic at all. This is an example of a controller. So you can see uh, this is a typical REST controller. We have the new action, we have the create action. And as you can see, uh, it's really, really small and uh, tiny compared to the normal kind of controller you probably have seen in another application. And uh, just for you to know, this is the real code from the domain create controller. So it's essentially, domain is one of the core components on our application. So you can imagine that creating a domain is one of the most complex part of our application. Still, as you can see, the controller is extremely readable, extremely um, short in terms of line of code. Uh, what it does is that it delegates to a command, passing the parameters that we expect, gets some uh, data out, and then if the response is successful, then renders the page, otherwise uh, renders another different page where we ask the user to provide more information. That's it, that's all about the controller. Then the next layer is the command. Now commands encapsulate the user business logic for us. So we have specific operation that the user can perform. And in fact, uh, other companies, uh, other libraries have a similar notion and they call them operations. Now, we don't call them operations because of a historical problem, but uh, yes, so that's essentially commands. Uh, we, you, can, you can think them about operations. Now, command can only delegate to lower level. Uh, this is more or less the same rule of controllers. You have never seen a controller in race calling another controller. That's the same for the command. In our application, a command can only go down beyond in the path. It cannot call another command. And this is an example of a classic, uh, of a command, the same command that you saw before. Uh, as you can see, there are, I mean, some includes that uh, creates the, the underlying structure of the command, and then you have some uh, preliminary first level business logic validation. Uh, so here's where we have the first level of business logic validation. Then we have permission, we have roles. Uh, after the domain is successfully created using a service, I will talk about service later on. After the domain is successfully created using the service, we perform some extra operation. For example, we track the activity of the creation of the domain. We send out notification about the creation of the domain. All those kind of things that you are probably used to see as callbacks in a model. Uh, but I can tell you that as soon as you have like dozens of these kind of activities within the model, it will be a, real, a huge nightmare to test them and to maintain them in your application. Uh, the command never raise an, uh, commands never raise errors. Uh, okay, what they do is that they have to return a result, and the, res the result can be either successful or unsuccessful. And if the result is an unsuccessful, has an error message. And even more importantly, the error message has to be a user-friendly error message, not a kind of exception message. Um, so in case we have an exception there, we rescue that, and then we try to provide a meaningful, uh, meaningful error message. Uh, then we have services. Now the services are the core of our business logic. Each service is essentially a public, contains public methods that represent the business unit, the single unit of operation that can be performed in our application. Uh, so example of services for us are the domain service, the two-factor authentication service. An example of public methods within those services are two-factor authentication dot enable, dot disable, uh, dot authenticate, and so on. So you can think about every single method is essentially a small unit, a single action that, uh, a single API that our application exposed to the external environment. Now, another interesting thing is that services are, I'd say, almost functional in the sense that uh, they don't store any state. Services don't have any state. And this is really important for us because it's really um, a readable implementation. Services get an input and then transform the input and return back the, the output. No internal state. This is an example of a service. So as you can see, uh, the creation of the service uh, uses dependency injection to get some of the other services that the, the service is interacting with. And this is really helpful when we have to isolate each service in the test suite. And then uh, we have several different public methods. We have the create, we have the delete, the lock. And this is one of the examples, though. The, so the creation, the creation, what it does is that it 
uh, interacts with the models, takes some attributes and then creates the, the object and then interact with other services. That's the other thing. That's where the interaction happens. A service can interact with other services. And after that, the service is expected to return um, a result. And of course, services can raise exceptions and they are, um, th those exceptions are expected to be catched in the, in the commands. Uh, this is another example of the service. This is a zone service that was used by the domain service. And um, uh, as you can see, a method can call other methods. So for example, here we have the creation of the zone that, create, that uses the creation of the system record and the refresh uh, of the zone. Because as I said, you can expect every single method to be a single task, a single operation. And so that specific operation can be reused elsewhere in the, in the application itself. But it's really important to code that specific component in one single way so that we can test the code um, in isolation. And then finally, we have the models. Uh, again, in our case, models are still active record models, but they are a little bit different. So they are essentially a, uh, an abstraction, abstraction for the storage engine. And they contain only methods that are useful to persist information to the database. Uh, models should have no business logic. Um, a model should not write to other models and then, uh, or trigger other model actions. And then we don't use callback, callbacks, as I said, except for data integrity. This is an example of a model. As you can see, for example, take the move to account uh, method. Now, the move to account method, as you can imagine, is shifting a domain from one account to another. It's a pretty huge task within our application because it involves a lot of business logic behind. We have to change the billing information. We have to increase the number of domains on that, on that particular account. But as you can see, there's no code here that deals with that. Everything is, happens in the service. Here we only, um, we only deal with the persistence of the information within the database. Um, and that prevents a huge model like the domain one to become like thousands and thousands of uh, lines, including every sort of kind of operation, including, I don't know, calls to external HTTP services, for example, which don't really belong in a, in a model. So at some point, at this point, you might be wondering why? Why we should have all this level of complexity? And in fact, if you are dealing with smaller applications, you probably don't need all this level of complexity. But still, you might want to have something in the middle between the models and the controllers that have stores the logic of your, of your application. Now, if we look, if we just consider the commands, the services, and the models, uh, you can actually understand that you have, you essentially coded the entire business logic of your application into an environment which is completely separate from the context of an HTTP request, right? And even separate from the context of a race controller. And uh, we actually took that one step further. So the core is codified and easily maintainable in an independent set of libraries. Because after all, our models are still active record models, right? So we don't have control over those libraries because they rely on active record. So active record can make changes behind the scenes that will affect our application. So our code, the code we rely on, the business logic is essentially coded within the commands and the services. So that's the reason why we have this kind of ab abstraction. And so that allow us to um, start shifting the focus and um, introduce different kind of controllers. So for example, the controllers can be Rays, but then you can also introduce, I don't know, Hanami, or you can introduce any other framework, right? At that point, once you have that specific isolation of your code, uh, you can easily introduce something, um, more things in the front, and you don't have to refactor, you don't have to change uh, how the code of your application work. Uh, so this is essentially a super simple, simplified example of our infrastructure for the DN simple application. Uh, as you can see, we have Rails on the front. We have another framework, which I will talk in a few seconds, Anami. Then we have the commands, we have the services, and we have the models. And you can see the flow of a specific request coming from the controllers going through a specific command, a single command that will delegate to one of more services, and then each service will interact with the um, models in order to accomplish the task. So next step, um, Hanami. Okay, I mentioned Hanami a couple of times during this talk. Uh, 
And uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about Hanami and why we use Hanami and what is Hanami, first of all. So Hanami, as I say, was formerly called Lotus. And uh, it's an emerging Ruby framework that was created by a friend of mine, Luca. Uh, Luca designed this framework in a way that uh, encourage developers to use good development patterns, okay? And you can see that if you check at the, uh, not only if you use Anami, but even if you check how the source code and Anami was, was implemented. Now, Anami is not 1.0 yet, but it's really stable and it's really mature. We have been using that in production at DN Simple for almost one year so far. Anami is not just a simple single task framework, you know? It's actually a full framework is made up, uh, is made of different components. So you have the application, you have the router, you have the actions, you have the views, you have the models, you have the migration, the helpers, the mailers, the assets, and the command line, right? So it's pretty much similar to race in terms of focus, in terms of uh, components. And the good thing is that you can just use some of them. You don't have to use all of them. And in fact, in the DN, Sim in the DN Simple API, we use the router and we use the actions. Some of the key features of Anami that I, I love are modular, modular architecture, which means you can use the components you want. You can use all of them or just a few of them, even in an existing application. Uh, a design based on composition that encourages you to use uh, object-oriented encapsulation, so good development patterns. And even more importantly, test-friendly approach. Um, given the good design behind the structure of, of Lotus, you can really test specific Lotus component in a super easy way. So the question, one question is, why the Simple adopted Hanami, and uh, rather than going through different frameworks or just staying with Rails, for example? So Rails provides, as you probably know, a way to format the same response in different ways. You know, you can return from a controller, you can return a JSON re response, you can return an HTML response, or whatever. Now, the problem is that this approach is not really maintainable uh, for large and complex, complex application. Um, because you might have, for example, changes in the view that will affect the API, right? So you don't really want to do that for really large application. So the choice at this point is, even, is either to create new controllers, so clone your controllers and have those controllers just to deal with the API, or go with a, an alter, alternative framework. And um, because Race is a massive, huge set of libraries, and because we wanted to have control of our code, we decided to not create more Race controllers for that. So the normal choice at this point is Sinatra, as you probably guess. Uh, Sinatra is a nice framework, but I have a kind of hate-love relationship with it because it's super nice, uh, especially for prototyping. But as soon as your application starts growing and you have like 30 different routes or 40 or 50, and then you have helpers, then you have formatters and so on, um, suddenly Sinatra, your Sinatra application will be really hard to maintain and really hard to test. Um, so at that point, Luca was starting, actually uh, a few months before we started dealing with that, Luca started his uh, adventure in building a new framework uh, called Lotus. And I knew Luca since a while. I was working with him in previous projects. So I decided to give Hanami uh, a try. Um, we originally started with Sinatra. So we implemented three, four API methods in Sinatra. And then in less than one day, I changed, well, actually in a few hours, I switched and I implemented all those methods in uh, Hanami, and I had them running in parallel for a while. I was running tests, I was running benchmark, and that was extremely stable. And the way we could test, and to be through, to be, uh, actually, we didn't, I didn't even test the Sinatra controllers, the Sinatra implementation, because it was so hard. And at that point, I was just prototyping the new API. Whereas when I switched to Lotus, the testing was so easy that uh, along with the library, along the Win implementation, I was able also to write the test. So at that point, we realized that Anami was working really well for us, and that's why we decided to stick with that and uh, essentially build the whole um, API v2 and that part of the platform with, uh, with Anami. OK, this. Here we go. I see more and more people sleeping, so it's time for Candice.
go. There. Am I missing someone? Yeah. Here we go. Right, in the front. Oh, here we go. Awesome. OK, last part of the presentation, how we use Anami in parallel with Vase. Uh, now everybody's looking for candies and nobody taking attention to my presentation. Yeah, awesome, well done, good job. OK, so um, the architecture that I presented before helped us to reach this goal because, as you saw, we split apart the, the, the controller part with the rest of, the, of our infrastructure. So we didn't really have to completely rewrite our code to deal with, uh, with Anami. So Anami is essentially a rack application mounted on the race controller. We still use the main, the primary race controller to uh, orchestrate the Anami application. As you can see at the top, there is the, the race routing file. We have a scope for the API version 2. Actually, we have a scope for the API, and we have a particular scope for the API version 2. And then we have the router, the routes for Hanami. So Hanami has its own router, and that's where we define uh, the, the rules for routing requests within the Hanami framework. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, you can see that. So here we have, in parallel, an example of the same controller implemented with race and implemented with Hanami. So on the right side, you have the Hanami implementation, which deal with the API. And on the left side, you have the race implementation, which is essentially our front end application. As you can see, the code is pretty much the same. And so because of the um, um, different layers that we have in our application, and because of our controller being so small, we, we could, it was really easy for us to start implementing the API with, with Anami. As you can see, we call the command, we have custom objects in order to deal with the parameters, we have custom serializers, as I told you beco before, because we love to be in control of our code. So we don't use any Anami uh, specific or race specific library for dealing, for example, with parameters or validation or the serialization of the response. We want to be in control of that specific part of the code. And this is an example of how a controller, an Anami controller is structured. And that's actually pretty, really interesting, the part where in Anami, every single action is a class. Sorry, it's, a, it's an object, right? So we don't have a single controller like in Vase where every single method is a different uh, action and you have to deal with public methods that are, are interpreted as actions and private methods and so on. So in Anami, every single action is uh, a class and the class has to respond to a method called call. And this is where the, the logic of the application happened. And that's pretty interesting because if you have a specific action that has to deal with some uh, non-default operation, you can just create a method or you can just override the standard implementation of the action and that will, that will be. Um, in this case, you can see we have before filters, so we do uh, validation of the subscription, whether the account is in good standing before performing any kind of operation. And uh, here we have two actions. One is to enable the WIS privacy, and the other one is to disable the WIS privacy. And um, Anami also has a nice DSL to configure uh, the controllers. So this is the example. You can include modules. Modules are essentially just Ruby code that you can reuse. And for example, here we have shared information, shared methods across all the different controllers that we use for validations. OK. So wrapping up my presentation, uh, my message today for you is, first of all, experiment. This is one of the key principles in DN Simple. And we like to experiment new ideas, to try new framework, to uh, experiment new approaches. And you should do the same. Uh, take the time every once in a while to do some research and development, uh, because you might be um, surprised how many new technologies and interesting emerging technologies you can find out of there. The second tip I have for you is get influenced by other communities. So I'm here today in a race conference talking about race and other frameworks. And uh, the talk after mine will be about a completely different language. Uh, so you have to be influenced by other communities. And it can be other frameworks or it can be communities built around other services, services you use. For example, we had an amazing experience when we started dealing and writing code that was interacting with uh, GitHub or even Slack, for example. Uh, 
By the way, speaking of Slack, I have a very super simple, a super quick announcement. Um, for all of you that are the Unsimple customers, we just released a Slack implementation, Slack add-on, so you can now manage all your domain through Slack, uh, and that will interact with the DN Simple account. Uh, that was actually a screenshot I took a few days ago, and as you can see, it's dnsimple.slack. But uh, today we got the news that the Slack integration was approved in the Slack uh, directory, so you can uh, enable that directly from Slack as of today. The other tip I have for you is, this is a really important tip, get influenced by other programming languages. Um, so in the last month, in the last four months, uh, I personally worked in uh, four different languages in parallel to build all the uh, DN Simple API clients. So I worked in uh, Ruby, in Go, in Elixir, and a little bit of PHP. And so um, that was really wide opening for me because interacting with other languages, working with other languages, made me a better Ruby programmer. I was able to deal with assumption to, I had to deal with um, information that was coming from our API, from our application that were based on Ruby assumption, and uh, I had to face with the problem of dealing with that from other different languages. So uh, every, once, every once in a while, be sure to take a look at different languages because they will be, even if you won't use those languages in your primary daily activity, they will make you, in that particular case, a better Ruby, Ruby programmer. Uh, this is a credit for the picture um, at the beginning of my presentation, and that's it for today. So thank you very much for being here. If you have any questions, you need to ask me.